flowers. They come in all colors, shapes, and patterns. Some are beautiful, and some are strange. But what's the point of having flowers? Hello. Hello. Yes, what is the point of flowers? Very pretty, maybe. But do they do anything useful? Very much so. Because the job flowers do is a matter of life and death to the plant. Remember, it's always the same question. Will the plant survive? Will the seeds start growing? Will the roots and shoots develop into a healthy young plant? And will the flower do its job? Have a look at this plant here. It's doing well, but even a healthy plant won't last forever. Like any living thing, one day it will die. But if it can reproduce itself, if it can somehow produce a new plant to replace it when it dies, life will go on and this type of plant will survive. This business of reproduction, replacing the old with the new, is where the flower has got some work to do. Now you know that trees are plants, but you might be surprised to find that these are flowers. In a hazel tree, the flower comes in two parts. These catkins here, and if you look on this other branch, you can just see a tiny red bud. Something has to get from here to here. What is it? Have a look what happens when the wind blows. Millions of grains of pollen. The catkins have to produce a great deal of pollen to make sure some of it reaches the bud. When pollen completes its journey successfully, it's called pollination. Pollination in oak trees happens in the same way. The wind does the work. And in all sorts of grass. No wonder people get hay fever in the summer with all this flying around. Millions and millions of grains of pollen, only a few of which will actually reach their destination. Pollen comes in all different shapes and sizes, and every type is special. It will only work with one particular type of plant. So, it's a bit hit and miss using the wind. But there are other ways of getting the pollen to the right place. These daffodils are very different to the flowers on the hazel tree. Now, I specially prepared one of the daffodils by making a couple of cuts so as we can look at the important parts. In daffodils, the part of the flower making the pollen is this part at the back here. In fact, if I rub the top of my pen along it, you can probably see that the pollen has come off onto the top of my pen there. And this part producing the pollen is very close to this piece at the top where the pollen has to get to. This part. So, no problem you'd think. Well, that works with some plants, but it's much better to get the pollen from one daffodil to another. So, can daffodils rely on the wind to carry the pollen? No. For a start, the pollen is inside the plant where the wind can't get at it so easily. And, what's more, this pollen is heavy and sticky. It wouldn't blow in the wind anyway. So, if the wind can't do it, the pollen will have to be carried from plant to plant some other way. And that's where insects come in, especially bees. As bees fly from flower to flower, they carry the sticky pollen with them, carrying the vital ingredient from one plant to the next. But why should bees help out in this way? What's in it for them? Hidden away inside the flowers is a sweet sugary liquid called nectar. 
It's what bees make their honey from. Bees and flowers go together very well. The flowers provide food for the bees and the bees pollinate the flowers. But first of all, the flower has to let the bees know there's a meal on offer. So, they advertise. Bees' eyes are different to ours. And if you see a flower in the way a bee would, the patterns become even clearer. But of course, it's not only bees that pollinate flowers. Birds come to drink the nectar too, and they can carry pollen off to another flower. some animals. All sorts of creatures can end up helping with pollination. Ants, beetles, flies. But there's got to be something in it for them. When a wasp lands on this flower, it flips it over to where the pollen is. But this is one of the strangest of all flowers. It's called a bucket orchid. Early in the morning, it fills its bucket with a special liquid. The bees arrive and buzz around. And very often, one will fall in. But it's not going to drown. There's a hole for it to escape, and even a little step to help it on its way. But just when the bee seems to be free, the flower holds it tight. The flower's pollen is in two neat little sacs, which are now carefully glued onto the bee's back. It takes about 10 minutes to dry, and then the plant releases the bee, and off it flies. If everything goes to plan, the bee will soon fall into another bucket orchid. Up the step, into the hole, but this time watch carefully. The second flower picks the pollen off the bee's back. The pollen has been transferred and the second plant has been pollinated. All very strange. But we haven't given you one very important piece of information. Why is it so vital for a flower to be pollinated? Remember, pollen is all different shapes and sizes, just like different keys. And pollen acts like a key too. If a grain of pollen gets from one plant to another of the same type, it can unlock the next part of the story, the next stage in the plant's growth. You can see what happens with our bean plant. We saw it grow to a healthy size last week, and now the flowers are developing. With luck, a bee will pollinate them. Now the flower's job is over, and they wither away. But where the flower was, a new part of the plant begins to grow instead. And this part of the plant is the fruit. The fruit? Well, if you'll believe that, you'll believe anything. But it's true, this is a fruit. 
You're going to have to wait until next week before we explore this particular mystery. Meanwhile, Sheila's been off on one of her trips again. An ordinary vegetable patch. Could be in a back garden anywhere, really. Well, not quite. With all the people who live and work in Hatfield House, you need all the food you can grow. Hatfield House is a magnificent building, nearly 400 years old, and it has a splendid garden to match. Flowers and trees and lawns. The things you'd find in most gardens, but on a much grander scale. You often find hedges in gardens, but this is part of something much bigger. How would you like a maze in your back garden? Don't forget, it's all made of hedges. So imagine how long it would take to trim all these. part of the garden's a bit like a maze too. These sort of small hedges have been planted and grown to make a pattern and the shapes in between are filled with colourful flowers. Or for contrast you can use stones or gravel or earth. This type of garden is called a knot garden because all the flower beds are tied together to make a complicated pattern. The man who planned Hatfield's gardens is remembered here in a special way. Can you see what I mean? Carved into the wood of the staircase, with his rake and basket full of fruit and flowers, is John Tredescant. He became the king's gardener and was one of the greatest gardeners of all time. John Tredescant laid out all the gardens at Hatfield. And this is one of the actual bills that he gave to his masters nearly 400 years ago. And he's written here some of the flowers and trees that he bought for the estate. Now, it's quite difficult to read. Ah, here's one I think I can make out. For two mulberry trees, six shillings. Uh, ah, here's another one. Can you see what this says? For one apple quince tree, three shillings. John Tredescant and his son, who was also called John, travelled to many different countries, bringing back plants that had never been grown in Britain before. Here's one of them. It's called Tradescanthia, and it was named after John Tredescant. One of the first journeys John Tredescant made was to Holland and France. Plants like this cherry tree were set out to grow in the garden at Hatfield. John Tredescant and his son between them visited many parts of the world to find new plants. They journeyed to Russia, Africa and America. And as well as plants, they brought back strange and curious objects, like this Russian abacus, which was a sort of calculator and this red Indian cloak. They lived in a house in London and visitors came from all over Europe to see their garden and buy plants and look at their collection of curiosities. The first ever garden centre and the first ever museum belonged to the John Tredescans. Just before he died, the elder John Tredescant was put in charge of a special garden in Oxford, which was the first garden of a particular type. There, the plants were grown to be used in medicine. The sort of plants they grew there are still used today. The bark of this plant can be used to make a sort of aspirin. And you might be grateful for eucalyptus if you've got a stuffy cold. Plants are very useful in ways you might not expect. Your toothpaste would be pretty boring without mint. And as well as taste, there's the smell. 
either put into perfume or like this in a bowl. Hmm, lovely. But remember, plants smell nice and look nice for insects' benefit, not ours. Lucky for us, we can enjoy them too. A lot of good ideas for art have come from plants. At Wall Fields, they've been trying their hand at making flowers from felt. Some are trying leaf prints. And leaf rubbings. And here they're making a plaster cast of a leaf. Here they're making their own knot garden. First, the pattern is cut out of paper. Then it's laid on the soil. Different seeds are put into different parts of the pattern to grow into a miniature knot garden. Or you can get together and make an instant knot garden out of coloured paper. Very pretty things, flowers. They're not very nourishing. Not much of a picnic this week. How do you fancy a cauliflower washed down with elderflower wine? But next week, it's going to be very good. The tastiest part of the plant, fruits. And then we'll explain the mystery of this peculiar fruit. Amazing what you find in the world of plants. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.